Well, good day, everybody, and welcome back. Well, today I want to talk about this 1938 Royal Varsity. This is a wonderful little typewriter. This belongs to our friend Matthew, who helped us with the latest type-in uh, last week here in the Albuquerque area. He wanted me to take it home and do a review of it, and I'm glad he let me do that because this is a wonderful little typewriter. Let's look at it. Stay tuned. Well, when we talk about pre-World War II Royal Portable Typewriters, people usually think about the Royal P's and the O's and the A's. These started in the late 1920s and went up to the early 1940s and became the predecessor to the Royal Quiet Deluxe. But there was also another line of Royal Portables that were smaller in size. And these were the Signet, the Signet Junior, the Junior, the Companion, the Mercury, and the Varsity. Yes, these were smaller size portables that started in the early 1930s and went up to the early 40s. And you notice the name Mercury in there. Well, there was a later Royal Mercury made by Silver Seiko in Japan in the early 1970s, but the first Mercuries were this smaller size portable in the 1930s that's related to this Varsity typewriter. And the thing about this typewriter that amazes me is I have a Royal Quiet Deluxe from the 1950s, and I'm also used to seeing the Royal P's and the Royal O's, but when I really started looking at this typewriter, the first thing that really struck me is how small it is. It really is surprisingly small. Well, I don't have a Royal P or Royal O to compare it against the Varsity, but I do have a Royal Quiet Deluxe from the 1950s. And if you look at the size of the cases here, the Varsity on your right, it's about 320 millimeters wide. The case for the Quiet Deluxe is about 345 millimeters wide. And the Varsity's case is about 150 millimeters tall versus 160 for the Quiet Deluxe. You can definitely see a difference in size between the two cases. They aren't the same size typewriter. And again, the front to back dimensions, 290 millimeters for the Varsity, 335 for the Quiet Deluxe. Definitely a larger case and heavier. And here at this angle, you can definitely see the difference in size between these two machines. So the Varsity weighs around 4.3 kilograms. The Quiet Deluxe goes off the scale for my little kitchen scale, so it's over 4.5 kilograms. Definitely a difference in size and weight. Two different kinds of typewriters, two different sizes of typewriters, which is interesting because, of course, uh, we often think of the Quiet Deluxe as a medium-sized portable typewriter that was in the 1950s competing against typewriters like the Smith Corona 5 Series. This one was made in 1957. But this line of typewriters here is very interesting because it is so much smaller and these models that shared their similar body style were kind of marketed during the depression as lower end in terms of low features, less features. However, I think their build quality though is really pretty good considering the economic climate within which they were built. Well, let's start with the left side of the carriage. So you have a carriage knob that does not pull out. It does have this infinite variable switch. Once you turn it, it will do the infinite variable. And then this switch here does single or double line spacing. And that is it. There is no carriage release button on the left side. For the right side of the platen, of course, you have your paper release lever that releases the feed rollers. And then you have the carriage release lever right here and the knob here. There is no paper support on the back. You do have a paper bale with two rubber rollers. So this machine does have uh, margin settings, both left and right. You push and slide them along the bar back here. There's the right-hand margin, there's the left-hand margin. So some of these low-featured Royals from the Depression era only had a left margin. This one has both left and right and, of course, a bell. Well, the machine does not have a paper scale on the paper table back here. Neither does it have a paper scale along the front edge of the platen. But it does have some line spacing on the card guide right up here in the middle. And there is one card guide finger on the right side of the vibrator. The ribbon cover hinges up 
It has two latches, one on either side with springs, revealing the ribbon spools, the vibrator, of course, the type slugs, but there is no touch control in here. Neither is there a bichrome switch or a touch setting on the front of the machine. So this is a very nice, elegant, American-style keyboard. It has the backspace key on the upper right corner. There is no margin release key, nor is there a tabulator key. Standard shift and shift lock. And I like these plated rings and the round keys and the dished in key tops. They feel really nice on the fingertips. And I feel that despite the small size of the typewriter, I can touch type on this machine pretty nicely. And my left hand pinky finger, the A key, does not interfere with the shift lock key because the shift lock is elevated up higher than the ASDF row. So despite its small size, I find I can type on it pretty nicely. And even though it doesn't have a touch regulator, I really like the touch of it. This typewriter really surprised me on how nice it is. And I should mention also there is a manual ribbon reverse on the side of the machine. So this machine is also lacking a paper guide on the left side of the paper table, and it's also lacking the paper scale back here, but it turns out that this paper table back here is exactly, or really close to eight and a half inches wide, so for American with letter size paper, you just center the paper right on the table there, and you're lined up like that, ready to type. Well, I think a really good question is, what is a machine like this like to type with, especially long typing? Because there's a lot of comments, or at least a few comments I've seen out there on the internet, that this line of portable typewriters from the 1930s, you wouldn't want to really use it for long-form typing. Well, it's true that a lot of the features have been taken off compared to a more full-feature typewriter. You don't have a tabulator, you don't have a touch regulator, you don't have a bichrome setting amongst the big three things that are missing. But really, ask yourself, if you're doing manuscript writing, do you really need a bichrome setting? Do you really need tabs? Do you really need a touch regulator, especially if the touch is already nice? So I would kind of argue against some of these naysayers for these kind of machines. I really like them. So the paper threads in very nice. There's a functional paper bale with adjustable rollers. The tension on the paper bale is really about perfect. It has only one carriage release lever on the right side, but that typically doesn't bother me. I typically use my right hand for moving the carriage manually and then the left hand for the carriage return. So. Let's sit down and uh, do a little typing, shall we? I really find this machine quite easy to use, and I find that I can type on it with a very smooth action, and I get no errors at all, no glitches, no hang-ups. And it has a really nice type style, a nice type imprint. I'm surprised overall by the quality of this machine. I'm surprised by the size of it, the diminutive size. Even the case is smaller than you might expect. Because I was used to seeing Royal O's and Royal P's and the predecessors to the Royal Quiet Deluxe. This is in another category, and I would almost argue, and I am going to argue this, that these are really ultra portables. They are taller than the typical ultra portable, but footprint wise, they are quite small. Which reminds me, there's another ultra portable. There's actually two ultra portables we should compare this against. One of those is the little Corona 3, which was being made concurrently with this machine, and that was probably its biggest competitor. And the other one is the more modern version of the Royal Mercury, the one made by Silver Seiko in Japan. So this is the comparison between the Royal Varsity and the Corona 3. The Corona 3's case is uh, actually slightly wider than the Varsity's, but it's not as tall. And depth front to back, uh, the Corona 3 is a bit smaller also. 
But now that we're looking eye level at both machines, we can see that, yes, the Corona 3 is a little narrower than the Varsity, but it's also taller. So I would certainly say the Corona 3 is an ultra portable, but I kind of want to make the argument here that the Varsity is also a ultra portable. It is surprisingly small, yet operates like a bigger portable as far as the touch. And of course, both of these machines were competing against each other in the 1930s and early 40s until World War II interrupted their production. And it shows a lot about how well designed the Corona 3 was. Corona 3 has a bichrome, and of course the Varsity didn't. There is also a margin release on the Corona 3. And there is also... I can see, oh yeah, there's a paper scale along the front edge of the platen. The Varsity lacks that. So even though the Corona 3 was such a small typewriter, it was fairly full featured for its time, even though it, of course, lacked a left-hand platen nub and you had to do the pinch method of carriage return line advance, whereas the Varsity has the more conventional lever. So I think it competes pretty well in basic typing functions with the Corona 3. It certainly is a better typer, just the touch of it. It's, the Corona 3 is a more cramped keyboard and a little more tinny, rattly sounding. Yes, you do have a full set of numbers, 1 through 0, whereas, the, uh, of course, the Varsity has the more standard 2 through 0, lowercase l serving as the number 1. But... I think I would argue that for longer writing, I would be happier with the Varsity than with the Corona 3, even though they're pretty close to the same size. And so there is a Mercury model built on the same chassis, the same design as the Varsity. But we have a later Mercury that was made by Silver Seiko in Japan. It's also considered an ultra portable. So it has a more modern keyboard, has a number one, and it has a margin release key, but it doesn't have tabs. It does, however, have a paper scale on the paper table, on the paper bale, and also on the front side of the carriage. So it's a little bit more full featured. It does have a bigger footprint, however. Let's show that. Yes, a bigger footprint for the 1970s version. So I think you could argue successfully that the Royal Varsity is an ultra portable and of course the 1970s mercury is quite a bit heavier as well i'm thinking this is a really nice typewriter equally as good maybe better touch i think than the japanese made royal mercury yeah really like the touch on this i like the looks of it it's really a sleeper typewriter it was sort of not on my radar screen but yet here it is well, of course, a comparison between this Royal Varsity and the Corona 3 or the Royal Mercury from the 1970s is only an imperfect comparison. You have to really look at each machine for what it is itself. For what I see here, I'm very surprised with the build quality. Of course, it was built in the 1930s. So we know some of the best typewriters were built in the 1930s. But it's going to be an older machine than a 1970s Royal Mercury. So condition is also an issue to think about. But this particular machine is in really good shape. I think the only thing it really needs is a new platen and new feed rollers, but it works quite well regardless. I'm very surprised at the build quality, and even like the ribbon cover is pretty substantial. Yeah, it's stamped sheet metal, but it's pretty rigid, and I think if you were comparing this to, let's say, a Hermes Rocket or Baby, I think the Hermes, especially the older ones from the early 50s, would definitely be considered flimsier and more flexible body panels, where this thing is built really well, surprised again at the size of it, how small it is, and yet the keyboard doesn't really feel cramped. I can type really well on it. It has a beautiful touch and a nice type impression. So I don't see this as limiting the writer. Like a lot of the comments I read for, about these machines, I don't see this as a limitation. I generally don't write with a bichrome, with red. Uh, I don't use tabs very often when I write. So I think the features it has are the essential features you need for a writing machine. And that's what this was made for. An inexpensive writing machine in the Great Depression that here it is, all these years later, still wonderful and still usable for having fun and creating on it, 
And that's, of course, what we always like to do with our typewriters. And I wish you the very best in your creative endeavors with your typewriters and your writing projects. And so, as always, stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.